morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, hi, Deb. <laughs> For those of you just arriving, we've got seats. Let's see. We've got some seats right down here in the center. There's two together. We've got four in the front and a little grouping over in the back. And of course, the, the pavilion. But those people are weird. So anyway, I just, I, you know, just saying. <laughs> I think my family members. <laughs> oh, yeah, my family members would be over there. <laughs> That's for sure. So just take your time. So there's, these seats are available, but they're right in the sun. These four over here, two here. Go ahead and grab a cup of coffee. We're doing great. Please turn off your cell phones. We'd appreciate that. Your neighbors would appreciate that. Okay, I think everybody's just about. Anybody still looking for a seat? You got it? Okay. One over here. Good morning. We have seats. We look crowded, but we have seats. Right there, back, if you're interested. Okay. Today's Open Circle mission statement is going to be read by Terry Escoval. Good morning. Open Circle provides a supportive environment to gather for social interaction and to improve our understanding of ourselves, our community, and our world. Presentations span a wide range of intellectual, cultural, physical, and spiritual topics. We do not necessarily agree with the ideas and philosophies of our presenters. We encourage you to listen with an open mind and form your own opinions. Thanks. Thank you. I'll keep that. Good, huh? This is the first time she's been here, and she got this. You know, most people, when they see me coming, she smiled when she saw me coming. Most people go, oh, you're going to ask me to read the Open Circle Mission Statement. We're always looking for presenters for Open Circle. So if you're interested in presenting or know somebody who is, we're scheduled quite, out, quite a bit out in the future, but it's good to get a handle on it if you think you might want to do it. You can speak to Margaret Van Every, who is right here, or you can speak to David Bryan, who is waving his hand right there. And they can give you all the information you need. You can also go on to opencircleahiheek.org, which is our fabulous website, and you can find out all the information there, what you need to do in order to be a speaker here. And if you aren't on our email sign-up list and would like to be, you can do so under the tree. We have a board with, a, with an actual pen, paper, you know, you remember pen, paper. You can do it that way, or again, you can be on the, on the opencircleahiheek.org website, and you can sign up there so that you can find out what's coming up and who's been here, and you can look at photos and things. And you can also, um, while you're there, you can find out that you need to go to Chapala Drone, and you can download videos. The most recent ones and the oldest ones are available for free, and Brad is bringing them together so that eventually all the videos of the last seven and a half, eight years will be available. That's a, quite a gift you're giving us. Thank you. Yeah. And Open Circle for making that possible to come together with him to do it. It's very sweet. Now we'd like to welcome those of you here for the first time. So, of course, Terry's going to have to stand up. And the rest of you are here for the first time. If you'd just please stand up. We don't make you do anything silly or anything. we just like to acknowledge you. Ah, woo! Hey! Look at all you beginnings. We'll start off with something that's, uh, you know, I should be embarrassed to tell, but here we go. <laughs> a duck, a skunk, and a deer went out for dinner at a restaurant one night. When it came time to pay, the skunk didn't have a cent, the deer didn't have a buck, so they put the meal on the duck's bill. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, am I going to get booed or what? A man is sitting next to his wife, and he asks her, whenever I get mad at you, you never seem to get upset. How do you control your temper? Oh, I just go and clean the toilet, she responds. He asks, well, how does that help? And she answers, I use your toothbrush. <laughs> 
Well, how do you control your temper? Yeah. My friend told me he had the body of a Greek god. I had to explain them Buddha is not Greek. <laughs> Here's another dumb one. My friend said to me I should not fall in love with the pastry chef I have been dating. Well, why shouldn't I fall in love with the pastry chef I have? She answered, he'll desert you. Ooh. <laughs> a man answers the phone and has the following conversation. Yes, mother, I had a hard day. Colleen has been very difficult. I know I ought to be more firm, but it's hard. Well, you know how she is. Yes, yes, I know you warned me. I remember you told me that she was evil and would make my life miserable, and you begged me not to marry her. I should have listened to you. You want to speak with her? Oh, all right. He looks up the phone and calls to his wife in the next room and says, Colleen, your mother wants to talk to you. <laughs> mean, mean, mean. How are we doing? Okay, our words of wisdom for today are from Charles Dickens. A loving heart is the truest wisdom. Next week's presentation, Making Peace, presented by the San Juan Children's Choir. After almost five years of studying, practicing, rehearsing, performing, being happy with our music school at San Juan Costa, the children and some parent musicians and guests will present their annual holiday performance making peace. We are providing a new repertoire that for the audience may appear easy and light, but has taken us a lot of preparation. The reward for us has been to discover a power within ourselves that was once hidden, but now set free through music. We look forward to our annual appearance with our good friends at Open Circle, where we are loved and feel more than welcome, where we feel accepted, valued, respected, and appreciated. We are happy, excited, and grateful whenever we play for the wonderful open circle. Doesn't that just touch your heart? So what I will say about this is we fill up. So if you want a seat close in, or want maybe a seat at all, we'll probably, we'll definitely put out more seats, but we fill up. So come early and, and get a seat. But be kind to your neighbor. Don't push them off seats or anything like that. <laughs> Our centering moment this morning is led by David Dennis. I always like to take a moment to stare at all of you. Some of you in the audience were born and raised in Mexico and others from countries up north and across the pond. Now the natives are well familiar with many of the rituals that go on throughout the year here in Mexico. But for the newbies, it may seem a little di different. And what I'd like to ask you to consider today, think about all of the celebratory attitudes, and beliefs, and values that accompany the Easter celebration and the ones that we've just seen November and currently in December. So, sit in your seats. Oh, you're already doing that. <laughs> Sink into your seats and take a deep breath and consider what is it that you are currently celebrating yourself in your life. I know you've had a lot of problems this year because I've talked to many of you. But right now, as you sink into your seat, Focus on that which is celebratory in your life and what is it that you are hopeful about as we enter 2019. Consider this as you sink into your chair and breathe. What is it you are hopeful about for the rest of this year and for next year? I'll give you a minute and a half to sink into that thought and that idea.
Continue with your current breath. Let it go and come back to this beautiful environment and be fully prepared to hear our speaker in, in a moment or two. Thank you. Thank you. This week's presentation, How the Virgin of Guadalupe Became One of the Most Important Religious, Cultural, and Political Symbols of Mexico, presented by Jim Cook. The Fiesta for the Virgin of Guadalupe is held yearly on December 12th. Since the Spanish conquest, this incarnation of the Virgin Mary has been a powerful symbol, particularly for Mexico's poor and indigenous. She is found everywhere, from cathedrals in her name to humble shrines beside remote mountain trails. Jim will explain her origin as a complex mixture of paganism and Christianity. He'll show how she was used during the spiritual conquest of New Spain to overcome native resistance, and then centuries later was the rallying symbol of the insurgents during the Mexican War of Independence. During his 11 years living full-time in Mexico, Jim and his wife Carol have traveled all over the country, absorbing its history and culture, extensively photographing the Fiesta of Guadalupe. In his blog, Jim and Carol's Mexico Adventure, Jim has published many of these photos and has written about the Virgin of Guadalupe's importance to Mexican culture and politics. Some of his photos have appeared in La Llave de Guadalupe, a book about the Virgin of Guadalupe by Mexican historian Arturo Roca. Please join me in welcoming Jim Cook. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. You can do better than that. <laughs> Good morning. Jeez. This isn't in that early. Thank you for coming today. Um, how many people here have attended one of my previous presentations? Oh, I'm developing a fan base. Well, previously I talked about uh, in previous years, I talked about the uh, Day of the Dead and um, the Santiago Matamoros, St. James the Moor Slayer. And today I'm going to talk about the Virgin of Guadalupe, um, which is uh, an extremely powerful symbol in Mexico. This coming Wednesday is the 12th of December, and it's one of Mexico's most important uh, religious fiestas. And it's the uh, Fiesta of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, also known as the Virgin of Guadalupe. Although she's well known and widely revered in Mexico, um, and actually in France too, my wife and I encountered her image in the cathedral at Notre Dame, believe it or not. Um, many foreigners know little about her. Her image can be found everywhere in Mexico. Um, there's a, a whole cathedral down in Zamora, huge place. It's devoted to the Virgin Guadalupe. Um, up in the, the Los Altos area, down in, in, the, in one of the deep canyons there, there's a tiny little one-room chapel that's got the Virgin of Guadalupe as the main figure in there. Um, she appears on statues and paintings in homes and businesses. People sometimes even put her image up on the wall outside their house to ward off the people with the tagging paint. You could even find it on keychains and t-shirts and other knickknacks. Why, why, is this, uh, why is her presence so ubiquitous all over the place? Because she's the patron of Mexico and particularly of its poor people and of its indigenous people. And this morning, I'm going to cover first the, the legend surrounding her appearance, and then what history tells us about the, her sudden appearance and the phenomenal growth of the Virgin of Guadalupe cult. I'll also talk about the early controversy between the Franciscan order and the Dominican order over whether she was even a legitimate version of Mary. I'll talk about the pre-Hispanic religious symbols that appear in her paintings and statues. And finally, I'm going to cover 
how she became a very important political symbol in Mexico. First, the legend. And I should say, this is, this is according to the story officially adopted by the Catholic Church about the first appearance of the Virgin of Guadalupe. It was on December 9th, 1531, exactly 487 years ago today. She was encountered on uh, Tepeyac Hill near Mexico City by an indigenous man. His Aztec name was, forgive me if there's any Nahuatl speakers here, his Aztec name was Kualatlatoasen. Aztec names are always kind of tongue twisters. However, his baptismal name was Juan Diego, so I'll use that one. The meeting took place near the ruins of an ancient temple devoted to the Aztec mother goddess known as Tanansen. The figure that appeared to Juan Diego was dark-skinned and spoke to him in Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs. She identified herself as the Virgin Mary and asked that a church be built on Tepeyac Hill in her honor. Well, needless to say, Juan Diego was taken aback by this whole experience. Nevertheless, he hurried back to Mexico City and sought out the archbishop, a man named Juan de Zumarga. The archbishop was pretty skeptical about the whole thing. I mean, after all, Juan Diego was a humble indigenous man who had only recently been converted. Now, this 1531 would have only been 10 years after the conquest. And this placed Juan Diego pretty much at the bottom of the social scale. So why in the world would the Virgin appear to a person like that? In addition, the Archbishop may have been a little suspicious that the encounter took place in the ruins of a temple to an Aztec goddess. And finally, Juan Diego's description of a dark-skinned, Nahua-speaking figure didn't exactly square with the standard Spanish idea of a lily-white version speaking impeccable Castilian Spanish or possibly Latin. <laughs> no doubt the Virgin took the whole thing under advisement and filed it in the drawer marked improbable. Well, when Juan Diego returned to the ruined temple the next day, there she was again. He was kind of shamefaced, and he had to explain he didn't think that Zumarga believed him. And she responded he should try again. So Juan Diego returned to the archbishop. He no doubt worried that he was going to irritate the great man. And tried again. Well, Zumarga was impressed by the fact that the indigenous man was pretty persistent about this. But he said, go get some proof. And I want a proof in the form of some sort of miraculous sign. So the next day, Juan Diego returns once again to Tepeyac, where he encountered the woman again. And when he reported that the archbishop requested a miracle, she said, come back tomorrow. That would be December 11th. And I'll give you the miracle that you need. However, Juan Diego ran into a problem at this point. Um, his uncle, a man named, I won't give you his Aztec name, but his, his baptized name was Juan Bernardino, was very sick, and his condition was getting worse. And Juan Diego thought that he probably was on the verge of death and that he should go find a priest to give him the last rites. Unfortunately, this meant that he was going to miss his appointment with the woman on Tepeyac Hill. So he figured, well... <laughs> Felt kind of bad about that, so he avoided Tepeyac Hill, took the, route, the long way around uh, in search of the priest. And so he was on, on his way on the morning of December 12th, when despite his best evasive efforts, there she was again. Well, he explained what was happening, and she asked, well, why didn't you come to me? And she told Juan Diego that he had already she had already visited his uncle and had, she had cured him. And Juan Diego later found out that this was true. 
And during her visit to the sick man's bedside, she had told the uncle that she wanted to be known as the Virgin of Guadalupe. And how the uncle responded to this is not recorded, but you can imagine he was probably a little surprised by the whole experience. Back on Tepeyac Hill, the woman told Juan Diego that the miracle was ready. She said, I want you to go and gather up the flowers on top of the hill and deliver them to the archbishop. Well, remember, this was December, and the flowers weren't growing that time of year. So he dutifully went up, and there were all these flowers growing. And not only were there flowers growing, but they were Castilian roses, which were not native to Mexico at that time. So he gathered them up, and he put them in his cloak, which is called a tilma. Now remember that word, a tilma is, is the, the basic garment of an Aztec man of that time. And it was basically just a rectangular piece of cloth that reached from the shoulders down to about the ankles. And they would wrap it around them and, and tie it, the, the upper corners over one shoulder. If you see any pictures of the old, the old codex, codices, you'll see pictures of Aztec men dra- dressed like that. So he, he took off his tilma and gathered up all the flowers and put them in the and hurried off to see the archbishop, hoping that it would be proof enough. Well, when Zumarga heard that the persistent Aztec uh, was back again, he was still pretty skeptical, but you know he was curious to see what kind of miracle that he'd managed to come up with. And he was surprised when the out-of-season non-native roses tumbled out of the cloak but both he and Juan Diego were absolutely flabbergasted when the image of the Virgin of Mary appeared on the inside of the tilma. And this is a f- photograph of the actual tilma, the image. Convinced at last, Zumarga ordered that the Virgin's requested chapel be built without delay. He further ordered the tilma to be displayed in, in, a, in the hastily built structure. It was adobe and thatched roof, no doubt. And it soon attracted thousands of pilgrims. I should say there was one more miracle. Um, When they took the tilmo in a big procession to the church, there was all kinds of celebrations and there was people shooting off arrows and one of the arrows hit somebody in the neck, mortally wounding him. And when the tilmo was brought by the person, they pulled the arrow out and he recovered and walked away completely intact according to the story. In the 18th century, a great basilica was erected to replace the chapel. And I believe there was another basilica that replaced that. But um, at any rate, the basilica has become the most visited Catholic pilgrimage site in the world. It is also the third most visited uh, religious site of any religion in the world. So that's the official story, but there are some problems with it. I always like to look for the back story. One problem is that none of the Catholic clergymen of the 16th century, when this occurred, wrote anything about the Virgin's appearance to Juan Diego, although it would have been a major event of the time. And in fact, Juan Diego's very existence is disputed. In 1556, Catholic authorities ordered an official investigation of this newly emerging movement around the Virgin of Guadalupe and filed an official report on it. And the report contains no mention of Juan Diego, miracles, or any other elements of the apparition story. And in the 1990s, um, there was a movement to make Juan Diego a saint, and doubts about his existence arose again. In fact, in 1993, the abbot of the Basilica at Tepeyac, this is the basilica where the tilma was kept, and the guy that was in charge of it, he expressed the opinion Juan Diego was a symbol and not a real person. Well, the resulting scandal forced him to resign, and Juan Diego gained sainthood in 2002. Even after 500 years, the grip of this legend is still very strong. 
However, there are other problems with the story. One of these has to do with the archbishop of the legend. Juan de Zumarraga was, definitely was a historical figure. He was a member of the Franciscan order and became the first archbishop in New Spain, as Mexico was then called. Although he was a prolific writer of journals and letters and whatever, he never mentioned Juan Diego or the Virgin of Guadalupe or any of the other key elements of the story in which he played a central role. Further, the original chapel built on Tepeyac Hill was not constructed by Zumarga at all in, in 1531. It was built by his successor, Archbishop Alonso de Montufar, 24 years later. As to Juan Diego's famous tilma, with this image of the Virgin of Guadalupe, it is still displayed in a glass case at the Basilica. Scientific tests conducted on it have been inconclusive, except to establish that it probably originated in the 16th century and has been modified several times since. So how did all this get started? There's no authenticated documentary evidence, although there's a couple of documents that have been discounted by historians. There's no authenticated documentary evidence, evidence that the cult uh, began during uh, the Archbishop Zumarga's tenure. He died in 1548, after which there was a gap of about six years before his successor arrived. The new Archbishop, Alonso de Montufar, finally got to New Spain in 1554. He was a member of the Dominican Order. The year after Montufar's arrival, he ordered a chapel built on Tepeyac Hill, probably using the stonework from Tenonson's ancient temple to the mother, mother goddess. And building Catholic churches on top of ancient temples with standard practice in the early colonial times. Kind of set, send a message about, you know, we're on top now. <laughs> to decorate the new chapel, he commissioned a portrait of the Virgin Mary. And the artist he chose was a talented young Aztec named Marcos Cipac de Aquino. Marcos set to work giving the image dark skin and incorporating a number of pre-Hispanic religious symbols in his painting. When the image was displayed, the effect was such that the native people began to worship it. While the Franciscans strenuously objected to this. They said, we can't be worshiping a painting Thank you. We can't be worshiping a painting. We should be worshiping the Virgin Mary, not the painting of her. And they firmly believed that the indigenous people were using the image to venerate Tonansen, the mother goddess. And they pointed out that the native pilgrims to the site were even referring to the image as Tonansen. Now there's, Tonansen basically means the, the earth mother or the, or, the, or the mother of the gods. And Catholics refer to the Virgin Mary as the mother of God. So there's a certain crossover there. But the indigenous people were definitely referring to her, to her as Tonansen. I should note that the Franciscans had been the first evangeliz evangelizing order to arrive in New Spain. They got there barely five years after the defeat of the Aztecs. And they felt that the new chapel and its image was undermining their efforts to stamp out devil worship. There had long been tensions between the two Catholic orders, the Dominicans and the Franciscans, and the Dominicans felt they had a right to pursue evangelism as they saw fit. Archbishop Montufar was a member of their order, not a Franciscan. It's also likely that the Franciscans were feeling somewhat dispossessed because the new man was not their guy. He was from the other order. In response to this Franciscan criticism of the new chapel and its image, Montufar ordered an official investigation of the situation. And the report was issued in 1556. It's the first authenticated document uh, about this emerging cult of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And both the painting and its artist are mentioned in the official report. But the story of the appearance of the Virgin and her miracle are not. 
In fact, the earliest version of the story we know today, the official story, did not appear until 1648, which was 117 years after her supposed original appearance. So why was all this so important back in the middle of the 16th century? I mean, what's the big deal? Well, letters and journals written by the earliest evangelists complain that, that willing converts were few and far between. Those natives who did convert often backslid into their old pre-Hispanic beliefs, or dev devil worship, as the evangelizers termed it. Then suddenly, conversions exploded. Clergy who were writing at the time clearly associated the surge of new converts to this strange new cult of the Virgin of Guadalupe. What apparently attracted the native people were rumors that her skin was dark and that she spoke Nahua. In short, she was one of them. The spiritual conquest of New Spain was the justification and ideological underpinning of the military conquest. It is significant that the emergence of the Virgin of Guadalupe cult occurred only a few decades after the defeat of the Aztec Empire. During this period, pre-Hispanic religious beliefs were being suppressed. Devotees of the old religions were being persecuted for devil worship and even burned at the stake. Ancient shrines and temples were being torn down and statues of the old gods were being destroyed. In fact, the temple of Tanansan at Tepeyac was destroyed as part of the spiritual conquest. Many indigenous people felt that the old gods had abandoned them when the Spanish arrived. In pre-Hispanic times, new gods had traditionally arrived with new rulers, but the old gods were usually respected by the new rulers. Christianity was different. Only its god and his representatives could be venerated. The new religion seemed very powerful to the native people, particularly since it was imposed by steel-armored conquistadors riding horses and carrying firearms. However, it was an alien religion. The images of its God, as well as other figures like Jesus, the saints, and the Virgin Mary, were invariably white, the skin color of the new Spanish overlords. To make matters worse, the Spanish clergy performed their rituals in Latin, which made them incomprehensible to the native people. At the time of the cult of the Virgin Guadalupe, when it suddenly appeared, the great mass of native people were demoralized and religiously adrift. The new cult stirred deep excitement. Unlike the angry white god of the conquistadors, this mystical female deity represented a benevolent mother who looked like the native people. Rumors allege that even, she even spoke Nahua. Better still, many aspects of her image could be connected back to the old beliefs. While the Franciscans viewed the Virgin of Guadalupe as a covert way to continue the worship of Tanansen, the Dominicans, including the new archbishop, strongly supported the new cult. They felt the Franciscans were purists who didn't see the benefits inherent in the situation. The surge of new converts provided resources and willing labor required to build the big ornate churches and missions. The Dominicans, in particular, always liked that sort of thing. If you've ever been to a Dominican church, you'll know what I'm talking about. Besides, reports of huge numbers of converts looked good to the top Dominican officials back in Europe. In short, Bishop Montufar and his fellow Dominicans simply didn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. Although the Franciscans continued to grumble for a time about the illegitimacy of the new cult, the Dominicans had won the argument. Since the archbishop was now a Dominican, the Franciscans had little recourse. All that remained to be done was to gather together the various rumors and legends about how the Virgin first appeared at Tepeyac and creatively fill in the blanks. Over the next hundred years, that's exactly what happened. In 1648, the story of the Virgin of Guadalupe's first appearance was published. Minor details were added over the succeeding centuries, but it became the official story still supported today. When the young Aztec artist Marcos painted the portrait, he included in the image a number of important pre-Hispanic symbols. And this is not unusual. If you go to many 
uh, colonial, early colonial churches today, they were built by indigenous stonecutters and woodcutters who were very talented. And what they did is that they covertly carved into the wood and the, and the stone images that relate back to the old religion. What I'll do next is walk you through these symbols and what they meant to, relig to indigenous people above and beyond their official Catholic meetings. And to do this, I will use this image here of the original Virgin of Guadalupe image as it appeared. And this, this, is, a, this is a photograph, um, my photograph of another photograph of the, um, Im, of the tilma that is still on Tepeyac Hill. The most obvious symbol is this here, the, what, what appears to be a halo. Um, and would, would certainly be seen as such uh, by Christians. Although halos in, in other places that I've seen them are usually around the head, so it's somewhat unusual it's the whole body. However, the native people, it would have suggested a sunburst, that these are solar rays coming out. And the most important deity of the Aztecs was the sun god named Huitzilopochtli. The sunburst would have strongly suggested a relationship between Tanansan and the sun god. Another important symbol is the crescent moon, which you can see here at the base of her feet. In uh, the Catholic myth, excuse me, in Aztec mythology, Huitzilopochtli was born as a full-grown warrior. And he was born from Tanansan, uh, or as she's sometimes known as Coatlicue. His first act, emerging as a full-blown warrior, was to kill and dismember his sister, who was the moon goddess, known as Coyol Squatsky. This was in, in retaliation for the moon goddess's attempt to kill Tanansan, who was the mother of the Moth. Now, why all that happened is a whole other story, which I won't go into today. You can look it up. But um, ever since, the, the moon is reduced to fragments during the course of its two-week cycle, as if it had been dismembered. So there she is standing on the moon, the, the, the fragment of the moon goddess, who has been dismembered by her son, the sun god, whose rays are behind her. So the Virgin of Guadalupe image, as seen by the native people, shows Tanansan surrounded and protected by the rays of the sun while standing on a fragment of the dismembered moon goddess. And this shows the relationship of all three of the key figures of the Aztec myth about the origin of their most important god. Now below the crescent moon, this is a little harder to see, below the crescent moon is a little cherub. You see him down here? He's got his wings. And he's holding holding up the Virgin. And this, you find cherubs like this a lot in 16th and 17th century um, Catholic architect architecture and, and uh, uh, the decorations in churches, and uh, particularly in uh, the Baroque. However, his, his posture in holding her up in ancient Aztec times, only royalty or the representatives of the gods could be carried like that by somebody. Now, she's also wearing a cloak here, which is, the color is a little difficult to make out, but it's turquoise. And it's covered with stars. Well, turquoise to the, to the uh, ancient people was ex extremely valuable because it, uh, all of it had to be imported from the southwest United States, uh, which wasn't the U.S. then, of course, um, but it, it was, had to be imported long distance. So it was a very extremely valuable substance, and they used it uh, um, in images that uh, related to, to royalty, uh, war, and fire. It's also covered with stars, which would suggest a heavenly connection 
and the native people would have considered the stars to be important too, but because since the earliest pre-Hispanic times, the rhythm of life of everyone followed the movement of celestial bodies as interpreted by their ancient astronomer priests. And they, they were remarkable astronomers and makers of calendars based on the movement of the stars. Then you have the tunic, which um, is, doesn't show up well here, but it's, uh, it's light red. And it's a color associated with Wichelopochli and the blood of sacrifices. And there's also floral designs on the, on the tunic, among which are small four-petal flowers. And there's one right there. And the four-petal flower is an extremely important symbol to pre-Hispanic people because the four petals represent the four sacred cardinal directions with the fifth point being the center of the universe. And you'll notice that that's exactly over top of Mary's womb. So what, what the artist is saying is that the center of the universe is there. There's another symbol. She's, she's, these tassels here are part of a, a uh, cord that in pre-Hispanic times women would wear around their abdomen just above the, the, the pregnant women would just above uh, their womb with a tassel hanging down. And uh, this was an indication that, that they were pregnant. And Arturo Rocha actually very kindly used one of my photographs in his book of an ancient statue from Guatemala of an of a, uh, indigenous woman wearing exactly that kind of tassel. And of course, her dark complexion was another symbolic indication to the, uh, to the indigenous people. And her appearance like this, with all of these symbols that they immediately recognized, electrified them. And the conversions exploded. There were like nine million people converted in the space of less than a decade. Well, the Virgin of Guadalupe is not only a religious icon, she has become a powerful political symbol in Mexico. And how this happened is also a pretty interesting story. In the 19th century, the late 19th century, the conditions had become ripe for a break with Spain. And uh, the indigenous people were very much oppressed. They lost most of their lands. The mestizos, or mixed blood people, were somewhat better off, but they still made very very uh, little in the way of, of wages. And even the well-off Mexican-born Spaniards felt themselves oppressed because there was a glass ceiling. You couldn't get any of the top lucrative positions in Mexico unless you were born in Spain. So um, all of this worked together, and eventually um, there were various plots to foment a revolt and in 1810, uh, we had the great revolt by uh, Father Miguel Hidalgo, uh, who at the little town of Dolores, over near uh, San Miguel Allende, stood on his church steps and gave his grito, uh, in which he invoked the name of the Virgin of Guadalupe and called for uh, throwing out the Spaniards. And they started mar marching with a little group of townspeople and um, some p prisoners they'd released from jail and uh, some others. And they started marching towards San Miguel uh, Allende. It was, just, it was known as San Miguel then. Um, and they came to a little town called uh, Atotonilco, which had a church. And in that church, well, I should say, they, the reason why it happened when it did, the, the, the independence is that they got discovered and the Spanish were sending people to arrest all the plotters. And so they had no time to, to form up their army. They, had, they didn't even have time to pick a flag. So they got to this church at, at Totonilco, and Miguel Hidalgo sees this. And he said, that's our flag. Well, this was either tremendous luck or a stroke of genius that he picked the flag that was, would most appeal to the 
poor and the indigenous people of Mexico who felt themselves oppressed by the Spanish. And just like in the 16th century when conversions exploded, recruitments came pouring in from every direction. And from a few dozen people starting out from uh, Dolores, within a, a couple of months, he had an army of 100,000. Um, unfortunately, it was an unorganized mob, and one of the things that they did with their hatred of the Spanish is they started killing every Spaniard they got their hands on. And this created somewhat of a problem with the native-born Spaniards, who sometimes the, the uh, Hidalgo's army was, was not as discriminating as they might have been in terms of picking who was native-born and who wasn't. And so Hidalgo lost the support largely of the, um, the Criollos, the native-born Spaniards, and um, he and his army were defeated about four months later. The Independence War went on for another 10 years and was ultimately victorious. But it was really a stroke, and that, that's how the Virgin of Guadalupe became this amazing political symbol. And it has, it has been used ever since in Mexico history, um, more specifically by Emiliano Zapata, in the Mexican Revolution of 1910 um, as a flag for his troops also and had much the same effect. All this will explain when you go into a Mexican church and you find the Virgin of Guadalupe, usually I would say maybe even most of the time, what you'll find is that the Virgin will be draped, the, the, the area around the Virgin will be draped with the Mexican flag. And it will also, or it will have around it the colors of the Mexican flag. So the next time you go into a church and you find the image of the Virgin, um, look for that, because that's, that's why it's there. So I hope I've helped to understand the religious and political sim uh, uh, symbol of the Virgin of Guadalupe and can give you some things to think about on Wednesday when we have our fiesta and any other time when you go into uh, a Mexican church and look around and find this image, that's what you're looking at. Thank you very much. We're going to take questions now, so if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. A mic will be brought to you, and then if you would stand up, hold the mic really close to your mouth, and ask your question, that'd be fantastic. Right here. Well, I think we got one right here. Yeah, but we're going to start, we'll okay. start here, and then we'll come. Hi, thank you for the timely speech on Hold Guadalupe. close, please. Hi, thank you for the timely speech on the Guadalupe. Can you talk a bit about the flag? Is that a reproduction or the original? Did it survive? Well. This, I, I took this photograph in the museum up in the little town of Dolores that has a number of the artifacts, and the sign there said it was the original. Take that with a grain of salt. I mean, it, it's hard to say, uh, but why not? <laughs> Here. I enjoyed your speech very much. It's very informative. Thank you. Um, but I have one quibble. I look at that Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, and she looks as, as white as I am. And I just cannot see that, th uh, that this was a darkened image that represented um, the uh, native uh, Mexicans. Well, that's probably a product of the photography um, and, the, and the colorization. Um, it is definitely, and always has been noted to be, uh, darker than the Spanish versions of the Virgin Mary that are seen everywhere. Please stand up. So thank you very much for the historical uh, view. What I'd like to know now is, so Wednesday we're going to see all of these processions. I'd like to know a little bit about that and the origin of that and what it means and what we're likely to see. Well, um, you'll see... A lot of people very reverently following behind the image. Typically the image will be either carried on people's shoulders or it will, might, might be in the, on the bed of a pickup truck. Um, also pretty usually there'll be um, uh, indigenous dancers in costumes dancing along. That was very common in those 
early days, the, the indigenous people just took their, their native dances, which were originated for other purposes, and, and used them to celebrate Catholic holidays. But you, that's, that's some of what you'll see, for sure. And probably it will go, the procession will end up, either originate at or end up at a church, and there'll be um, a service related to that. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh-huh, back in the, ba in the pavilion. Here in the pavilion, whose people are discriminated against. <laughs> no, I have a... You have spe you're special. <laughs> I have a question about um, the lack of any history about the Virgin in the 1500s. And my question has to do with, couldn't that just be a question of discrimination? If this archbishop came from Spain and was a high Castilian, why would he write about this Indian who, you know, he wasn't really certain about? And I just want to follow up with the lady before me. You know, when I came to Mexico, I was really interested in, I've been three times to the Basilica, because I wanted to see the Telmach and to see if the Virgin was dark, because all of the paintings I see, as far as I'm concerned, she looks white, and she doesn't look Indian to me. I've been three times past on the moving corridor, the moving walk, and they put the Thing up so high, you really can't see her face, but she doesn't look Indian t to me. She doesn't look dark to me, okay? At least as dark as me. <laughs> well, there seem to be two or three questions in there. I'll try, <laughs> try to answer. Um, I, the bishop, neither one of these bishops wrote about the story. Um, the story was not published until 100 years later, uh, the, the official story. What they did write about was this, the appearance of this new cult and, and, and the, the report that came out was uh, to settle the dispute between the Franciscans who said, you know, this is a scam, we shouldn't be doing it, and the Dominicans who were saying, hey, the churches are full. What, you got a problem with that? And so um, the, the earliest description has, has, has no description at all of the official story as it stands now, which didn't happen for 100 years. Um, as to her appearance, uh, the, um, how it does or does not appear to us, it, it appeared to people then that she was much darker she had been painted much darker than, uh, uh, than Spanish people, and that the indigenous people very much related to her because she appeared more to be their color than, um, than, the, than the white skin of the Spanish. We're over here. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. I recently heard another talk on this subject by a woman of faith, and of course it was slightly different. Um, and the sources that she quoted said that the tilma, that the flowers stained the tilma in such a way that they created constellations and various other religious figures. And then later, people came and added things in paint. Um, and I forget what those were, but they are now part of it. So I guess it sounds like, from what this lady said, that maybe you wouldn't have been close enough to tell. But this all story had to do with NASA scientists and all kinds of people studying it and not finding um, evidence to the contrary of the, the miraculous event. Well, I looked into some of the different scientific reports that were done, and, and it was pretty limited. And NASA, in fact, uh, was one of the things I looked at, and NASA has denied that they ever did that. Um, <laughs> there were... Uh, there were some photographic examinations, and um, I, I'm not a technical person, but um, it was very limited because the church would not allow, uh, for example, a sample to be taken and tested because um, they didn't want to damage it, and it's a holy, it's a holy object, and there you go. But um, there were there were some examinations, 
And the only thing that they were able to establish is that yes, it most likely came from the 16th century and that it had been um, added to over time. Um, but some of the original elements were still, in fact, very much intact, which is somewhat surprising after 500 years. Back here. Hello, and thank you very much for your talk. Um, two quick questions. The Black Madonna in Spain, is she another rendition of the Guadalupe? And secondly, in the churches that I visited around Mexico, sometimes the Guadalupe is higher up, and sometimes Jesus is underneath, and sometimes Jesus is higher up and the Guadalupe is underneath. Is there a meaning for that? Well, your first question, I don't... There is a, there is a version of Guadalupe that's much less known in Spain that actually preceded her, and some people think that her name came was transferred over. Um, the black version, I, I don't think so. I don't think there's a connection there. Um, the second part about the relationship of Jesus to the image, um, I have personally noted, I I'm not, should say I'm not a Catholic nor I'm a religious person, but I'm very interested in the, in the cultural aspects of religion. When I've gone into Catholic churches, one thing that I've been often surprised by is, is that um, how few times that Jesus is the central figure. It's usually when you walk into a Catholic church, there'll be the, the central figure on the altar where the whole focus is will be a saint or it will be some version of the Virgin Mary. Um, but Jesus will be off in a side chapel or maybe on a cross down um, somewhere not a central focus. And I, I've never quite understood that. I, I was raised as a Presbyterian and Jesus was like the, the main thing and there wasn't anything else, right? So it always kind of puzzled me when I, when I looked at that. And I don't have an answer for why it's that way. If Maybe somebody here who's a Catholic does have an answer, but... Um, uh, it's been it's been puzzling to me why why that occurs that way. Okay, right here. I I am a Catholic, oh. <laughs> and well, I had a question, but uh, the Virgin Mary and the saints are are examples to be Christ-like, and they play such an important role in our our religion. But I was um, curious if you had done any research on Our Lady of Fatima in Portugal because I didn't know much about Our Lady of Guadalupe, but their stories are so similar with the, the young peasant children seeing Our Lady. And that was, I think, in the early 1900s. And they didn't believe their story either. So I'm just wondering if you know of any connection or was it, did the children in Fatima know about Our Lady of Guadalupe or had it... Um, to answer your question, no, no, I have not done it. I, I am familiar vaguely with the uh, version of Fatima, um, but I'm, I, don't, I don't know that there's any connection, um, so I really can't answer your question beyond that. Okay. <laughs> Where are we? I, I, I have a question about all the other virgins. I'm really confused about this. Are they all supposed to be sightings of a version of Mary? And yes. did they all come after Guadalupe? No, no, no. The Virgin Mary has appeared um, many times over the centuries. And this was one appearance. They, as, as I understand it, they are all the same person. Just different aspects or facets of the same person that occurred in different to, to different people in on different occasions um, and that each of them has their own legend about what happened in that case and, and the second thing I wanted to say is um, just from looking at stuff that happened in England when the Catholics were taking over mm -hmm. and the, it's the same story they built on the same places as um, mm -hmm the old religion, they included symbols of the old religion, but it's always been sort of said that the craftsmen snuck these symbols in um, 
from their old religion. And I wonder if that's true, because if I was trying to get the Catholic Church going, I'd say, put some of those symbols in there, and then that'll convince, then the old people will come to the new thing. Does that make sense? I, it absolutely makes sense. In fact, um, everybody here is familiar with Christmas trees. Well, the way that originated was that the um, early evangelizers were trying to convert the heathen Germans who were the German barbarians uh, at the fringes of the former Roman Empire. In fact, the German barbarians had taken over big parts of the Roman Empire at that point, and um, they worshipped trees. And so the, uh, and particularly um, um, coniferous trees, pine trees. And um, so the church, the early church has always been very practical about these things, just like the Dominicans were. And they said, hey, if it works, why not? A lot, for example, Christmas was set at that time of year because of the winter, is it solace, solstice or equinox? It's solstice. Because of the, uh, it's close to the, to the winter solstice when a lot of pagan religions were celebrating religious holidays. So why not just stick it in there? And the tree. And the Christmas tree in Germ from Germany. Yeah. I think we're done. There was one more here? I don't think we're taking any more, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she, she who must be obeyed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to have you here again. If you'd help us close up, we'd love that. If you'd stack your chairs, you can turn on your cell phones if you want, pick up your coffee cups. Thank you for bringing your own coffee cups. And we look forward yes. to seeing you next week. Here, Remember, if you're coming, come early to get a good seat. <laughs> <laughs>